We've been going through the book of Acts for quite a while now. We're in Acts chapter 18 this morning, if you can turn there. Acts chapter 18. Last week we went over uh, chapter 17 and we saw uh, Paul uh, give uh, three basic messages or four messages in three cities. He preached in Thessalonica, he preached in Berea, and then he preached in Athens. These were all basically Gentile cities. In Thessalonica, there was, you know, there was a lot of people that believed, a lot of Jews, a lot of, a lot of Gentiles, and then in Berea, a lot of Jews and Gentiles as well. The, the interesting thing about Berea, though, is that um, there were these, uh, these Bereans, the local Gentiles there, or Jews for that matter, that actually searched the scriptures daily to see if what Paul was saying was so. And I encourage you guys to be like the Bereans. Even though at the time when they were searching the scriptures, digging through the Bible, they weren't believers, but they were doing that in order that they you know, would become believers. They were checking out if Paul was, uh, was actually preaching truth or not. So I encourage you to be like these Bereans, and even more now because we are believers now, right? Now we can understand God's word. There was a time in my life when I didn't know Jesus, and I just read the Bible to get brownie points with the Lord, and I figured, you know, well, you know, God is going to bless me, Lord. I did my, you know... 10 minutes of scripture re reading, my crouton, right? And, but it really didn't affect my life. It didn't change me till after I accepted Jesus and the author of the Bible, the Holy Spirit, indwelled me. And it's like having your own, per the author of the book, hanging out with you and helping you understand what you're reading. So that's what we want, I want to encourage you this morning to do. So as I said before, Paul is preaching. He, he's on his second missionary journey. Right now he's alone. He's going to travel to Corinth. Last city he was at was Athens, and Athens is known for all their, their idols, all their philosophies. He, he, he was preaching at Mars Hill, this just ginormous uh, you know, hill area where all the, the, the enlightened people would go. Sadly, though, they weren't really enlightened. They were more, more uh, afraid of the dark. They didn't heed to their, uh, their previous philosopher's advice. Plato once said, we can easily forgive a child when they are afraid of the dark. The real tragedy of life is when men are afraid of the light. And that's exactly what happened. Paul preached Christ. Paul preached the resurrection there. And uh, they were afraid of the light of the world. They didn't accept Jesus Christ. Uh, Paul got these three responses from them. Some mocked and they rejected the gospel completely. Others said, well, here are you again on the subject. They basically procrastinated, right? And we get a lot of that, right? Well, that's good and I'll, I'll, let's talk about this later. I'll, they changed the conversation on you. But there were a few people that did get saved, that they did receive the message, and there was fruit in Athens, even, you know, if you, if, if you, if you would think there wasn't a lot of success there for Paul. But now Paul is traveling to another area. He's going to Corinth. Now, Corinth was, if Athens was where the enlightened were at, Corinth was where the darkened were at. It was a dark place. Before there was uh, Las Vegas, there was Corinth, okay? Before there was uh, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, there was what happens in Corinth stays in Corinth. Back then, if you were an actor and you were up on stage and they said, well, he's playing the part of the Corinthian, that means that that person was either playing a drunkard or an immoral person, a, a floozy, right? So again, being a Corinthian wasn't a popular thing. The, this city of Corinth was basically, a, basically like a port area, and it was in southern Greece. I don't have a map up here, but I'll try to explain it to you as best as I can. There's basically this big old round penin the peninsula there. And then there's this strip of land, about three mile radius strip of land. It's called uh, Isthmus. And that's around that area is where Corinth was at. So the sailors, the businessmen, all these uh, Romans that would come, instead of sailing 250 miles around this peninsula, they would stop at Corinth, park their boat there, walk three miles and get another boat on the other side. And it'd be a lot easier to get where they needed to go, right? Sa safe travels and so forth. But that was a place that was full of sailors, full of, you know, businesses, all kinds of people, a lot of Gentiles and so forth. It's been said that by night there was about a thousand, uh, they called them vestral virgins that came down at night and they enticed the men into uh, sexual acts. But there, there was nothing virgin about them. They were actually temple prostitutes. Uh, they served at the temple of Aphrodite there. So that's where Paul now is headed. Let me tell you why I titled this message uh, Fantastic Four. I, I mean, I'm, I don't know about you, but I, I, like, I like comic books. Uh, actually, I, I, don't know, I don't like comic books. I like uh, movies like the, Mar the Avengers, uh, you know, Spider-Man. I, I enjoy those kinds of movies. Uh, of course, you know, there's, there's discretion when my kids are watching them or so forth. But, uh, you know, where did we get the idea about superheroes? Who were the first superheroes? Why do we even need to invent superheroes? Well, what is it? Is there something in us that really, you know, we, we want to be out there, right? Do we want to be superheroes? 
The Bible ha has its own superheroes. I see Jesus. Jesus is my superhero, right? He's out of this world. You know, there is nothing that he can't do. He holds all things together. In the Old Testament, we have Samson, right? Samson was the original Hulk. He, uh, he had superhuman strength, and it all came from the Lord, obviously. He had, he had to keep, you know, his, his Nazarite vow as well. So when I think of a biblical superhero, I think about Samson. I think about David, the boy that destroyed this, the, the original Iron Man, this giant full of armor. And then, you know, there are all these superheroes in the Bible. When we think of Paul, we don't really think of him as a superhero. When we think about uh, Apollos, we don't think of him as a superhero. We think of that, well, he's an awesome Christian, right? An out-of-this-world Christian. But let me tell you, uh, today we're going to talk about four fantastic people, okay? Or four heroes of the Bible, heroes of the faith. And I'm going to show you that you can be a hero of the faith, and I'm not teaching some kind of prosperity here, but you can be an, an, an out-of-this-world type of person for Jesus if you choose to. Choose to. And the... Uh, in the, I don't know, cartoon series, the Marvel series, the Fantastic Four, there are these four characters, right? There's this guy called The Thing. This guy, The Thing, he, uh, he's rock-like. He's got strong, uh, thick skin, right? He's got superhuman power, a lot of strength and endurance. Paul was like that. Paul was beaten. He, he, he had a, you know, skin was torn from his back from all the beatings he got. He was stoned to death, and then he rose up and got back into the city again. Paul was a lot like this guy, uh, The Thing. Then there's these two other, there's this couple, Miss Invisible, and I think the other guy is Mr. Uh, Fantastic, right? She can disappear, and he can stretch out. Aquila and Priscilla, which we're going to talk about today, are like that. They're also a couple, but they're more like sidekicks of, of Paul. She can't get invisible, but she knows when to, just at the right time, to appear. And then the other guy, the guy in the back, Mr. Uh, Human Torch. All that guy can do is fly and turn into fire. We're going to read about a guy named Apollos. Bible says that he literally was boiling hot. He was a fiery preacher. And we're going to take out what we can take out and see really how we can be, you know, extraordinary people for the Lord. Let's begin here in verse 1 of Acts chapter 18. I titled this, er this part, Psychics are recruited in Corinth. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. I will tell you, while Paul was in Corinth, he wrote the... Uh, 1 Thessalonians, and he wrote 2 Thessalonians, but he also wrote uh, Romans, okay? And it's pretty interesting because Romans chapter 1 was probably what, inf what, when he wrote ch Romans chapter 1, he was probably being influenced by what he was seeing at the time in Corinth. Let me read to you. It's in Romans 1, 26. And he's in Corinth when he wrote this. He said, For this reason God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use of wo for what? is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the, nature, uh, the natural use of, of the women, burned in their lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of error it, that which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are uh, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death. Not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Okay? If this wasn't a dark place, I don't know what was. Paul was around these kinds of people, and it's not different than today. We see all these things today, right? Men have exchanged the use of women, right? We see that today. Nothing is new under the sun, as Solomon said. So this is where Paul's at. He's alone. His companions are not with him yet. He's, just, he's preaching the gospel. Look at verse 2. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. Notice the parentheses here where Luke gives us. Because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and he came to them. So Paul hooks up. He camps out, basically, with uh, Aquila and Priscilla. Now, Aquila and Priscilla are... Uh, Aquila is always mentioned with his wife, Priscilla. But there's times when Priscilla is mentioned before her husband, and there's times when Priscilla is mentioned alone. Some people believe that she was more, uh, uh, more involved with the church. She, was more, uh, uh, she probably had different gifts than her husband had. She was more known by Paul. But they were both believers. They were both Jews, Roman citizens that had recently been kicked out of Rome. It's believed that, some, some scholars believe that uh, 
that they were a lot of the Jews and even Jewish Christians were kicked out of Rome because uh, by Claudius because there was a lot of rioting between Jews Jews against the Christians and Claudius well he didn't want to distinguish between both of them so he's like well get both of the both of the the Jewish Christian cults at the time with the with the Jews get him out of there right so for a time they were kicked out but this is like a divine appointment with Paul Paul is gonna pick up some sidekicks he's actually gonna uh, work with them it says here in verse 3 so because he was of the same trade he stayed with them and worked for by occupation they were tent makers and what that meant was that they were leather workers Paul worked with a black goats uh, a goat's hair type of a skin that's what he did that was his job and, and we're about to see that Paul was a hard worker he always supplied for himself when the church could not support him as a traveling missionary here and here he's new at Corinth there aren't any established churches. He's the one that's going to establish churches. So in the meantime, while he waits for, uh, for Timothy and Silas to bring the, the love offering from the church in Philippi, he's going to be working, uh, you know, six days a week and, 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 you know, rest on a seven day, you know, preach on the weekends. It says in verse 4, he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both, both Jews and Greeks. Again, Achilla and Priscilla are now part of, Paul's team. There's other things we're going to know about them, but they're more like sidekicks. Paul talks about them in Romans 16. This is how the New Living puts it. Give my greetings. Notice Priscilla goes first here. Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in the ministry of Christ Jesus. In fact, they once risked their lives for me. I am thankful to them, and so are all the Gentile churches. These guys really use their resources for the gospel. They open their homes for, for the Bible studies, for all these things. They were there they were available for Paul. Though they weren't the ones in the front line, they were always backing up Paul. We, we need more Achilles and, and Priscilla's. They, were, they stuck their necks out for the ministry. In verses 5 to 23, now we're going to see, uh, I titled this part, A Boost, A Villain, and A Vow. Let's start with the boost. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. So again, his old partners come, saw uh, Silas and Timothy, and in another scripture of the Bible, it tells us that they actually brought the financial aid to Paul. So even though Paul was encouraged just by having his, you know, seeing his brothers again, and he's preaching the gospel with a fervency, I think what, what, what the message here is, is, is trying to imply was that now he was more devoted to the gospel now that he, you know, he didn't have to work full time. The NIV puts it like this. Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching. So he, he went from part-time ministry to full-time ministry now that the, the church had provided. Verse 6 says, But when they opposed him and blasphemed, speaking of the Jews, he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. So what Paul did here, and this was a, a common gesture back in the day, okay? He made sure that they saw him do this, right? He dusted himself off. He, you know, shook himself off. And, and he made sure people saw him. This was a gesture of judgment. He's like, I want nothing to do with the judgment that's going to come, come upon you. Paul was real. He, he wasn't a moderate Christian. He told him, yeah, Jesus loves you, but you need to repent. And he told him all the time. And in order for people to understand that they're drowned, that, you know, that they need a, a lifesaver, they need to understand that they're drowning. Paul did that all the time. But what, we, what I do see here is that he says he's innocent. He says, I'm clean, right? I've done my best. I've gone to, to, to the extent, and now you're just rejecting what I'm trying to give you. Jesus said, don't cast your pearls before swine. And I'm pretty sure there's family members, maybe, uh, you know, uh, friends, co-workers that you, you, you've tried and tried and tried again, and they're still rejectors of the gospel. That doesn't mean they're not going to get saved ever. That just means, you know, you sort of, you know, I'm confidently telling you, you, you got to stop now with that. You know, don't throw your pearls before swine. Keep them in prayer. Allow the Lord to work in their hearts. Look for those open doors. But if you know people that are constantly rejecting the gospel, Jesus says you're wasting your time. When they opposed him and blasphemed him, it says. Verse 7, And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshipped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. That's kind of funny because if you read it in context here, he's, he tells them, Okay, you, you Jews, I'm leaving you. I'm going to the Gentiles. And he literally walks a few steps out of the building and goes next door to a Gentile's house. The church was next door. They basically shared a wall, most likely, with the synagogue there, right? And now you're going to see that another man, the, basically the, the ruler of the synagogue, gets saved. It says in verse 8, 
Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. And that's basically what did it here. The, 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 the ruler of the synagogue here got saved first and then the rest of the congregation. Somehow, some way, Paul was more effective here by not being in the temple, but by being next door in the church. Maybe because they were so close together, the, the ruler of the synagogue, they heard the worship songs, they heard Paul, Paul preaching. They were, you know, they were thinking about what Paul did when he dusted himself off. He's like, I want nothing to do with your judgment. And that brought that man to the Lord and his congregation here. So it says here, Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household. Many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. What you're about to see between verses 8 and 9, it's, it's implied actually. A lot of scholars believe that during this time, there was something, something uh, really difficult in Paul's life. Luke doesn't tell us, and Luke is just writing what Paul has told him to write here. Right? Paul is giving him the, giving him the, the rundown of what happened. But a lot of people believe because of the vision that Jesus gives Paul here uh, in verse 9, that Paul was actually uh, scared of something. He was suffering. He was human like us. He had his own fears. He was a tough guy, but he had his fears. So again, people are getting saved. Uh, you know, the church is getting bigger. Things are happening, right? But it's been said, when you open the gates of heaven, you also open the gates of hell. They, see, the devil's not going to mess with people that are Christ, moderate Christian, comatose Christian, 007 Christian, right? He's not going to do that. He, you're not bothering him at all. Charles Spurgeon once said, the devil doesn't kick dead horses. Why would he, right? But Paul, he wasn't dead. He was alive. He was preaching. He was running, you know, the gospel here. He's busy for the Lord. Notice, notice the vision gives him in verse 9, the, the vision the Lord gives him. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. He says, do not be afraid, but speak and do not keep silent. A scholar by the name of uh, Robertson's word picture says, literally he's saying here, stop being afraid, Paul. Stop being afraid. He wasn't telling Paul, don't be afraid. If you're thinking about being afraid, he says, stop being afraid. Paul was being afraid here about something we don't know. Again, if you read Romans chapter 1, it was a pretty crazy town, okay? I, I, I'd definitely be scared, especially if uh, it was just me and a couple of, of the friends there. The Lord encourages him, though, this is, th this is one of God's promises for us. He says in verse 10, For I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. The latter part there about many people in the city, a lot of scholars believe that's referring to God's sovereignty. A lot of people for you to reach, a lot of people that, that are, you know, ready, ripe for the harvest. You know, you continue to do it, I will protect you. God is our protector. Uh, what's his, uh, G. Morgan Campbell, uh, an old uh, British preacher back in the day, uh, when he started out as a young minister, he would go uh, to uh, nursing homes, and he, he would have this constant Bible study with these two old ladies. And as, as he was going over this text, and he reads, you know, where the Lord says, I am with you, no one will attack you, and he, tells, he turns to the ladies, and he's like, isn't that a wonderful promise? One of the old ladies looks at him sternly, and she's like, young man, this is not a promise, this is a fact. You know, she was aware of this, that this is true, right? This is something that we can you know, claim for. God is with us. God will protect us. You know, the safest place to be is in God's will. Um, I, I have missionaries come here before, and, they, you know, they live with their family. They got like five kids, and they live in Honduras, and, you know, they, they raise families. A lot of the missionaries, they got a bunch of kids. They just multiply quickly, and they're in England. And so these, these places that I wouldn't raise kids, or I would rather go alone. But they're there, and they're faithfully doing that. And one of them told me one time, you know, the, the safest place for you to be is in God's will. And if you're in God's will, you're in the safest place. To be, that's something we need to understand. Paul was in God's will here. In verse 11, it says, He continued there a year and six months. Notice it says here, teaching the word of God among them. And that's what we need, right? As Christians, if we're going to grow, we need the teaching and the preaching of the word of God. We need to grow, right? There's philosophy, there's psychology. We don't need that stuff. That's man's word. You need God's word. That's what's going to help you grow. You know? Well, you don't need, well, five ways to speak to uh, your wife or Three ways to raise a, a rebellious child. Those are good things, but you're going to find those things in the Bible as you read it, you know, verse by verse and book by book. I want you to take note of these three things, jot down these three things about Paul here. Number one, he carried a hero's burden to save the lost. He says in verse 6, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. He did everything he could to reach people, right? He knew he had that responsibility. A great theologian by the name of Peter Parker once said, you know, with great, uh, 
With great uh, power comes great responsibility. He also goes by the name of Spider-Man. Not real. But, uh, but it's true, right? What he said is true. We, we can do something w with the gospel. Jesus once talked to a man in Acts, uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 56, 57. He says, you know, I'll follow you, Jesus, right? But let me go back and bury my dad real quick. And Jesus says, you know, let the dead bury their dead. You go and preach the kingdom of God. You know what he told them? He told them that because this man was able to preach the kingdom of God. The rest, the dead, the spiritually dead can't do that. A spiritually dead person can't make another person alive by preaching the gospel. For that matter, they have no, no intention of doing so. So again, we have a job. We have a great responsibility to reach people for Christ. He's given us this, this responsibility. Number two, he experienced fears like the rest of us. Paul was a, a fearful man at this time. And it's not bad to be fearful. The problem, was when we allow, the problem is when we allow this fear to turn into trembling, this fear to stop us from actually preaching the Word of God. You know, I get nervous sometimes I come up here before I come up here, but it goes away. You know, it, it, just, it just happens when you step out in faith. God is faithful and to show you that you know, He's going to be with you and He's going to strengthen you. But we've got to step away from our fears and towards God. You know? Have the fear of the Lord is what God wants us to have. My son recently has been going through a, I don't know why, but he's eight years old already. He's going through this phase where uh, he's scared. You know, my wife and I wanted to go on a, on a date, right? We're going on a regular date. And then uh, we leave him with my mom, and two, three minutes later after we drive off, he's texting us, you know, are you, when are you guys going to come home? Uh, you know, this and that. And, and then he, he just started panicking out of nowhere. So I'm trying to find out, get to the root of the problem. Did you watch something you weren't supposed to watch? Uh, did somebody tell you something? You know, what's going on? And we still haven't been able to find out. Uh, but I, I try to do a lesson with my son. We went to the park. If you guys went to the Harvest uh, Festival last night, that, I went to that park earlier when we went to go scope it out. And there's like this jungle gym looking thing that you sort of got to climb up these stairs. And I was going to do a little test of, of, you know, test them for, uh, for trust here. So I told him, okay, Junior, get up on the steps here and then don't look back and let go. I'm going to catch you. And at first he was kind of scared and so forth. He started going, he started getting more comfortable. He started going up two steps, three steps. There was like four or five steps. Eventually, when he was right at the top, and we got, it took us a while to get to the top, but I told him, Junior, don't look back, don't flinch, you know, I'm going to catch you, I'm still here, I haven't, let you, I haven't let you down before, have I, right? There's no reason you shouldn't trust me. But he was kind of scared, and he sort of, be, instead of, you know, raising his arms like that and just falling back, he sort of put his elbows, elbows like that, and he got me right in the face, and I felt, you know, it's one of those times when you feel your brain hit the back of your head. And, you know, with God, when God gives us these promises and he says, don't fear, I'm going to be with you, I think it hurts God when we don't trust him. I think, you know, God is like, well, it hurts him to see us really live in fear. Right? He's never failed us. He's never going to fail us. So why don't we trust God in, in, in all things? Number three, the secret to Paul's strength was his weakness. Paul is a guy that once said, when I am weak, then I am strong. This is, the, this is where the actual verse is found in 2 Corinthians 12. He said to me, and this is right after Paul had prayed three times for this thorn in the flesh, whatever it was, that the Lord would take it away. And, and this is how, how Jesus answers him. My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches, and needs, and persecutions, and distresses for Christ's sake. Notice, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Samson was also like that. Samson had a Nazarite vow to keep. He, he had a weakness, though. It was women, right? He gave, over, he gave himself up to Delilah. He gave him her secret, cut his hair off. But it really wasn't the hair, so much the hair as much as him really letting go of God and just giving himself over to sin. But notice, here, here, here's what I'm referring to, God's second chance. When, when uh, they had plucked his eyes, literally, the Bible says that they scooped his eyes out, okay? Samson's eyes were taken out. He was blind. He was, he was made a mockery of, and he was chained up. And that's what sin does to us. It blinds us and it imprisons us. And Samson is there, right? But in weakness, when he repented of what he did, and he, 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 the Lord gave him another chance. The Lord gave him his strength back one last time. And I think that's what, what happened here. It doesn't tell us directly what, what, uh, what fears Paul was going through, but I'm sure that he... He pleaded to God, and the Lord gave him this, this answer, He's, this encouragement. Don't fear. I, I am with you. Right? We see this, we see this uh, uh, illustration also 
uh, on the boat when uh, the, the disciples are, you know, the 12 disciples, are there. there's a great storm, the perfect storm, like the movie, right? And, and it might have been even greater, been greater than, that, than that, but the Bible says that Jesus might, would have even passed them by, but he didn't. Jesus actually is walking on water, okay? He's walking all over their fears, and they had like a Scooby-Doo moment. So one of them is like, uh, oh, it's a ghost, right? And, and it's not a ghost, it's Jesus, and then... Notice this, Peter, Peter is the only man uh, recorded in history to walk on water besides Jesus. And he did that because he stepped out of the boat in faith, not in fear, right? You're not going to step out of the boat in fear, you're going to step out in faith. So he did that, but his problem, what happened with Peter? He started looking down, right? He started looking at the circumstances, he started looking at the storm, he took his eyes off of Jesus, and then his, you know, he started wobbling, and he started drowning, right? Let me show you an illustration. Let me look for, uh, Andrew, you want to come up here? Andrew's a pretty, uh, pretty athletic uh, guy. Pretty sure he can balance his broom. You know, in Sunday school, you can learn a lot of uh, props. Eventually, if you teach the congregation, you'll get to use. So what I want you to do, Andrew, is, and we're going to count for you. We're going to count to see how long you can balance this broom by looking at it here. Just try not to uh, hit anybody. One, two. Keep going, as much as you can. Okay, it seems pretty easy, right? Not too bad. Okay, now what I want you to do now, hold it. Now I want you to do the same thing, but instead of looking up, I want you to look down right here at the base. Let's count, one, two. <laughs> Wait, maybe that was a fluke. Let's give him another chance, come on. One. Thank you. And that's basically the illustration for what happened with Peter, right? He looked down, and he didn't have that balanced life with Jesus anymore. But he, when you're looking at Jesus, when you got your eyes straight on Jesus, your gaze is up, that's when you're going to, you know, have that balanced life. A hero's power lies in their gaze. If we keep our eyes on Jesus, we can move mountains. Second part here at... Uh, Verse 12, it says, When Gaio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat. And this was basically the courtroom of the day. This uh, Gaio was a Roman uh, judge. It says here in verse 13, saying, This fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, notice he was probably going to take out his, um, his Roman citizen card here and, and use it, right, for his advantage. But, but notice, God was with them. He didn't, even, he didn't even allow them to open his mouth. Gaio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there would be reason why I should bear with you. But if it is a question of words and names and your own law, look to it yourselves, for I do not want to be a judge of such matters. He was an impartial judge. He didn't want to deal with religion. So again here, verse 16, And he drove them from the judgment seat, then all the Greeks took Sosthenes and the ruler of the synagogue and beat him before the judgment seat. So he turned a blind eye to, actual, to the actual uh, Jewish uh, synagogue ruler here, Sosthenes. He got beat up. The Bible tells us that uh, eventually this, this guy, Sosthenes, got saved. He was a faithful follower of Paul. But first he tried to beat Paul. It didn't work out. So if you can't beat him, join him. And, and that's what he did. He literally got beat into the kingdom. And you might be thinking, well, I thought in, in the previous verses we read about this guy named Crispus, right? Crispus was the ruler of the synagogue. Well, what happened? Well, if you remember, he got saved. Probably because he got saved, they, kicked, they booted him out of the synagogue, right? And that'll happen. Sometimes you're going to get persecuted at work because you're a Christian. And, you know, all that means is that God has another job for you. If you, if you truly get persecuted for being a Christian, not for taking long breaks or for being late all the time, but for being a Christian, for sharing that light, then, then it's all good for you know, with God. He's just got another job for you. So this other guy, Sosthenes, that replaced him now gets beat up by the, by the, by the Greeks here, probably because he started a riot and, you know, they didn't work out for them. And, but Paul is safe, just like God had told him, nothing's going to happen to you. Not a hair, you know, on your head is going to get misplaced. Paraphrasing there. So again, 
Verse uh, 16, and he drove them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. But Gaio took no notice of these things. You know, in today's day and age, in, in our country especially, the, the government doesn't have an impartial view. They are more, uh, there is a double standard against Christians today. And we see that even in government schools as well. I read an article the other day about a Marine dad that was pretty upset because of, of his daughter's homework. Part of her homework was to study Islam and the five pillars of Islam and how good they were. And basically, it was almost like a conversion type of a deal that she had to write an article on. And the dad goes to the principal and he tells him, he, these are his words. He says, you won't teach the Ten Commandments in school, but you'll teach the five pillars of Islam. After he said that, he got banned from the school. For Why? I mean, it, it's true, isn't it? If we're going to be impartial, well, we need to be totally impartial. But that's not what's happening in our government today. There's a double standard. And you'll hear a lot of stories about atheists wanting to sue uh, uh, Christian uh, congregations, but you're never going to hear one about atheists trying to sue mosques. It just doesn't happen because there's a double standard again. Again, verse 18, so Paul still remained a good while. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria. And Priscilla and Aquila were with him. Again, faithful sidekicks. He had his hair cut off at Cancrea, for he had taken a vow. Now, some believe this was a Nazarite vow, and if it was a Nazarite vow, it meant getting a buzz cut. It meant no more grape juice or any kind of fruit from the vine, and it, uh, and it may, meant staying away from dead things. Sam said had a Nazarite vow. Uh, I think John the Baptist had one, and Samuel had a Nazarite vow. The difference is they, they were supposed to have a long, uh, basically a, a lifelong Nazarite vow. Their mothers were actually, uh, their parents were the ones that had sort of had them do it. But here, this is more of a seasonal type of a vow. Sometimes they did this Nazarite vow temporarily. Uh, and in Passover is when they would offer the hair they cut off and they would burn it. It was like a sacrificial thing, a way to, tell, to worship God and tell him, Lord, thank you for back, having my back back there. Or thank you, Lord, for, uh, you know, for doing these great things in my life. This was something that Paul did. And notice he never imposed it on nobody. It's not like, hey, you got to keep, have you been keeping your Nazarite vow? Right? Steve, have you been fasting? Or, uh, you know, have you been, you know, doing your daily prayers? Right? It, it's not something that was imposed upon people. It was a self-edification type of a deal here. And that's what he was doing for the Lord. Notice in verse 19, he came to Ephesus and left him there. But he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. Now, in verse, uh, in the next verses here, in verse 20, now verse 6, we see that he says, okay, Jews, I'm no longer going to go to you. I'm done with you, right? But he didn't mean all the Jews. He just meant that synagogue where he was at. Because here, now he's back again crashing the synagogues. What he meant by that, I mean, his regular thing didn't change. He went to the Jews first, and then he went to the Gentiles. But notice in verse 20, when they asked him to stay a longer time with them, he did not consent but took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was a place that he was going to fulfill this. He was going to burn his hair in Jerusalem. It was something that, that, you know, a way to consecrate himself to the Lord. But I will return again to you, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus, and when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and greeted the church, and the church here is referring to the church in Jerusalem, it's implied there that he did his vow. He went down to Antioch. The church in Antioch was a sending church, okay? The church that sent him out as a missionary. He finishes here his, uh, his second missionary trip. In verse 23 is when he actually starts again on his third missionary journey. It says, after he had spent some time there, he departed and went over to over the region of Galatia and Phrygia in order, in order strengthening all the disciples. Now, what Luke's going to do here, he's going to, Take us away from Paul for, for a moment, and uh, we're going to revisit him later in another chapter. But right now, he's going to focus in. He's going to zone in on these two sidekicks and this one undiscovered uh, hero by the name of Apollos. But before then, we need to understand that, you know, heroes sacrifice of themselves. Paul was a hero of the faith, and he lived set apart for God, right? You want to be a hero for God, you need to keep yourself holy. Yeah? Be set apart for him. Whether that means keeping a vow, and you know what? A lot of times we hear, "Well, Christians don't keep problem." You know, uh, you Christians don't don't uh, don't make vows because you're going to break them, right? But if you think about it, if you're married, you made a vow to your wife, you know, to be faithful till you know in sickness and in death, right? You're going to be faithful to your wife. That's a vow. 
Job talked about a vow not to looking at a, a not looking at a, a younger woman again. These vows are just you know simple things. If we went with that theology, don't keep vows because you're going to break them. Then what's stopping us from saying, well, don't sin because you don't repent because eventually you're going to sin again. It, God knows we're going to sin again. The, these are encouraging things. He kept the vow. Look at verse. Look at Romans 12. 12, 1. He says, Beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, notice, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Paul is talking about holiness here. He's talking about discipline here, right? He doesn't, he, you know, it's things that we don't like. Discipline and holiness and all these things, right? But it's true. We want to be used by God. We've got to, we've got to be set apart by God. Notice these three things just from Romans 12. Number one, he wants us to offer our bodies to him, right? We offer our bodies to him. The Bible says, you know, you don't belong to yourself anymore. You've been bought with a price. You belong to Jesus. You're a bond slave of Jesus. So live set apart for Jesus. Number two, offer your actions to God. Paul is the same uh, Paul that wrote in Galatians 2.20, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. You know, Jesus died so that you can live for him. And number three, offer your mind to God. And you might say, well, I don't see that one. Where, where, where's the offering the mind up? Well, look at verse 2 again in Romans. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Your mind also belongs to Jesus. The Bible tells us constantly, you know, uh, meditate on godly things, on praiseworthy things, because sin starts in your mind. And if you allow sin to start taking root, eventually that thought is going to turn into an action, right? That the, the enemy starts in your mind. It's a battle for your mind. I like how the Phillips translation puts it. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold, but let God remold your minds from within. And you know what? We mold our minds with God's word. We mold our minds with prayer. We mold our minds with knowing him and making him known. Look at the last part here in verse 24. A certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria. I want to show you six things about this guy, six abilities he had. An eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit. Being fervent in spirit literally says to boil with heat. This guy was boiling hot like that uh, fictional character. He flame on. This guy was actually a fiery preacher. He did preach, you know, uh, hell and, and brimstone and all that. Note, it tells us why here. He spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he only knew the baptism of John. Some have seen him as sort of like uh, the Old Testament saints that believe they were looking forward to the cross. He probably was only preaching the baptism of John. You know, the Messiah is coming, repent, he's coming soon. And somewhere along the lines, he didn't get the memo. Maybe he went on a vacation somewhere and he came back and he's still preaching. He doesn't know Jesus died, resurrected, ascended, and the Holy Spirit came down. But Aquila and Priscilla are going to, uh, you know, sharpen him up a bit here. Verse 26, so he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Notice, they don't interrupt this message, right? They don't, uh, you know, they, they don't get up in the middle of the sermon and say, hey, you're, you're wrong about this or that. No. They wait till after the service is over and they talk to him. They bring him aside. Some, some have even said they actually invited him over for dinner at their home and they, you know, they instructed him in the Lord. Okay? See, it, they probably look for, uh, for, for Apollos in, on their Facebook. They're like, I don't, know, I don't know this Christian. He's not on, on my Facebook page. He was actually on MySpace. He was actually stuck in, in the early 2000s. Right? They needed to bring him up to speed. The Bible says iron sharpens iron. That's, that's all they were going to do here. Verse 27 says, And we des when he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace for he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. Notice the change after they refine him. Now he's preaching Jesus and the person and work of Jesus Christ, that Jesus is Lord. So before he was probably preaching hellfire and brimstone, repent. And not that he let go of that, but now he's teaching the grace that comes about through Jesus Christ. And that's the, the two things we need to preach, right? We give people the bad news, but we give them the good news. If we don't give them the bad news, they're not going to appreciate the good news, right? So last point, not all heroes are created equal. Paul had a different, uh, different gifts. Apollos had different gifts. Even the Christians in the early church, they made a mistake. They're like, well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Apollos. 
other guys are I'm of, I'm of uh, Paul, and then Achilla and Priscilla. Why weren't they, f you know, fiery preachers? A lot of us are not preachers, you know, in the sense that we're teaching our congregation, but a lot of us are ministers of the faith. Some of us have different gifts, and we need to use them to the best of our abilities, and God is going to reward us the same. Apollo's abilities, look, he had six. He was an eloquent speaker. That means he was good with words. He was powerful in the scriptures, and the word there for powerful is denatos, which is the word we get for dynamite in our English. Uh, number three, he, he was instructed in the way, so he knew about Jesus. He was able to catch on fire as well because, again, he was a fiery preacher. And number five, number five, you probably might have not got off the bat, uh, right off the bat found, but he was teachable. He was humble. He, he learned from what Aquila and Priscilla said. He wasn't too proud to, to listen. Number six, he was a mighty apologist, right? He defended the faith. And that's how, he, how it ends here with, with uh, him refuting, refuting Jews publicly. And you know what? We're all called to be apologists. We're all called to defend the faith. Jude tells us, contend earnestly for the faith. And the word there for contend is the same word that they used to use for wrestling. Contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. The faith has been delivered to you and it's been entrusted to you. We are to defend it. Not to necessarily debate and argue with people, but make sure we give an answer to every man that asks of us. So we end with Achilla and Priscilla. What were their, you know, can they turn into fire? Uh, you know, can they, you know, cast out demons, do all these things? What were, their, what were their abilities? Number one, they used their resources for the gospel, okay? It's been said that that name Priscilla was actually a prominent name. She was, she was a rich or I'm not sure. They owned the business of tent making, right? So instead of Paul actually working with them, Paul was most likely working for them. But again, they use their resources. The Bible tells us that they open their house for the gospel. You know, you can use your resources by opening your homes up for a Bible study, by, by giving of the church, by, you know, just hosting people, by using your gifts for God. You know, Batman and Robin, even though they're fictional, they're not like your regular uh, traditional superheroes like Superman, right? They didn't have laser vision, superhuman strength, none of that stuff, right? But they use their resources for their mission. You know, Bruce Wayne, well, he had uh, awesome gadgets, also a uh, Robin, right? They didn't have supernatural abilities. Again, as Christians, we use our resources for the gospel. You're creative? Well, do something for the church. Number two, faith, uh, they were also faithful psychics for Paul. And three, they had the ability to disciple. This is another thing we are called to do, right? The Great Commission, right? Make disciples of all nations. They had to the, the ability to disciple, and that's what they did with Apollos. You know, if I mention Billy Graham, most of you know him here. If I mention to you the person that originally discipled him, you probably won't know the person, right? Uh, you know, uh, Billy Graham, Greg Laurie, Chuck Smith, right? We, we know these guys, but we don't know who actually discipled him first off, who, who geared him in the right, stirred him in the right direction. You know, Chuck Smith talks about his mom in, in the early stages when he was young. She always read his Bible to him, always brought him up the right way in the Lord. His mom, you know, was a great influence upon Chuck Smith. And we all, we all should be disciples. We can be heroes of the faith by being in the, in, the, in the background, being in the scenes, in the back scenes, discipling people. That's all Apollos needed. He, look, this guy was on fire already. How much more when he received the power of the Holy Spirit? This guy was like on, on dial-up still. He was stuck in the 90s. And Apollos, uh, Aquila, and Priscilla, here, dude, let me talk to you about broadband. You know, faster stuff, right? Um, he, he was still with his flip phone, and Aquila and Priscilla were like, here, let me show you about the iPhone. Let me talk to you about GPS, this camera, megapixel, and, and Siri. Let me tell you about Siri. All they did was sharpen the skills so he can be used better for God. And that's what God wants us to do. When you disciple somebody, you're sharpening the skills up. Right now, you're being discipled to a certain extent because you're listening, you're hearing God's word. If you're allowing your hearts to open up and heed to what God is trying to tell you, you're learning something and you're growing. And that's what God wants. He wants us to be discipled and to make disciples of all nations. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, I thank you for all the, the, the champions of the faith in the Bible, Lord. Lord, we ask that you use us as well, Lord. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for dying on the cross for our sins. Lord, uh, you died for us while we were still your enemies, Lord. We thank you for your grace, Father God. Father, we pray, Lord, if there's somebody here this, this, this morning that doesn't know you and, and you've spoken to their heart this morning, Lord, I pray that they, they would come to you now, Lord. If you are here this morning and you don't know Jesus, raise your hand and you want to accept him, raise your hand. Has the Holy Spirit been speaking to you? 
Father, we thank you for your grace, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you continue to use us. We pray that you bless this, uh, this uh, building, Lord. We pray you bless each and every person that has come here for this divine appointment. We ask now that we can lift our voices and worship you in spirit and truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand together.